Good morning, CCR. So as Reverend Glenn has mentioned, my name is Asher. I'm a third year student in Trinity Theological College. And really, first things first, before I even begin, I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for, welcome, for welcoming me and my wife into this community. You know, but you know, you've given me this opportunity not just to learn from you, but also to be part of the life of this church. And for that, I'm truly, truly grateful. Thank you also to Reverend Glenn for giving me this privilege of bringing God's Word to you today. So this morning, we are continuing in our series on the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. We are on the fourth of seven letters now, the letter to the church in Theatira, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. And just a note, in case you are a little bit confused, the slides up there will be showing the verses from the ESV version, I mean, not the NIV which you are using. Don't worry, it's the same Bible, the same God who is revealed. Um, we still are Christians if we use these various um, Bible versions. But shall, before we begin, shall we pray? God, you alone are worthy of all our praise, all of our worship and all of our lives. Send your Spirit upon us this morning. Help us to hear your Spirit speaking and calling us to give ourselves wholly to you. Help us to see Jesus, your Son, rightly as our victorious King, the one who is faithful to his own. And so now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my Rock and my Redeemer. Amen. So, I know it doesn't really look like it right now, but what feels like an entire lifetime ago, I used to play football. Hold on. Ah, yes. I used to play football. I wasn't really the best of players. In fact, I actually started playing football only properly when I was 17 years old. But I made it to the school team somehow. And I won't say which school, except for the fact that um, this school's motto fits quite well with the message of Revelation um, and that promise in, in the book there that uh, the best is yet to be. <laughs> so, you know, my teammates, who some of them are up there, were really, really talented. But the year that we were competing for the title, the competition was also unbelievably strong. Now, we trained hard, really, really hard. We had session after session after session of training under the blazing hot sun each week. We'd run until our legs felt like jelly and then do it all over again the very next day. Our goal? Our goal was to play attractive football, different to how the other teams in the division did. But, you know, if I was to be honest, I think there was this nagging sense of doubt at the back of all of our heads. Would this training pay off? And being different amid a sea of successful teams, would we even be able to succeed? But I will always remember this one particular moment, this one particular moment in one of our demanding training sessions. With sweat pouring down our faces, one voice shouted out clear as day as many heads hung low and we thought about giving up. And that voice shouted out, Come on, guys! All in! Nothing less! You know, that quickly became the rallying cry of my team. All in! Nothing less! When things got difficult and when we wanted to give up. All in! Nothing less! Fully committed to the system that we had learned, even though it was different. Even though we saw other teams taking the easy route, so-called and succeeding while doing so. You know, when the chips are down and the odds are stacked against you, you've got to be all in. Nothing less. That isn't just for football. I'm obviously not here to talk to you about that. It also seems to be the message that Christ is telling His church in Theatira, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29 that through the Spirit, the church is being called to be fully sold out for Christ. Now, what does that mean and why does it matter? 
Well, the church in Thyatira faced many, many problems. But people who study the text and its background generally point to this, this one thing as the biggest challenge of all. Thyatira was a rich, successful city that was built on trade. But not just any trade, it seems. Trade in fine goods. The real expensive stuff. If they had brands, they'd be the brands that you would find in MBS, the brands that I don't even know how to pronounce. And as most traders did for the longest time all throughout history, they formed guilds, associations. They controlled trade. And if you wanted to trade with them, you had to be like them and do as they do. Part of that involved offering sacrifices to their pantheon of gods. There were so many of them, and it's not religious, they would say. It's just a part of culture. And if you didn't do that, you were simply frozen out. Now that was serious. Try surviving just try surviving when you have no access to the economy that's meant to help you earn a living. If that was the reality, then this is why the church needed to hear this. That it needed to be all in and fully sold out for Christ. But friends, it's not just only for the church back in the first century. In fact, some of you seated here this morning might be thinking to yourselves, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. It isn't too different from the challenges that I face at work today. Running a business now, I'm facing similar issues. That if I am somehow different from the culture that is around me, I get left behind. Well, you're right. There are some things that aren't too different from the first all the way to the 21st century. And so the message to the church in Thyatira, pointing out why and how they can live lives that are all in, nothing less for Christ, that's a message for you and for me too. So I just have two points for us this morning. It's a simple message. And so let's dive right in, shall we? The first point from verses 19 to 23 is this. We are challenged to go all in, nothing less, with our commitment to who Christ is. Because close enough doesn't cut it. Close enough just isn't good enough. Now, I know that's something that most of us don't like to hear. Nowadays, there are method marks that are awarded to students in school. We often hear about celebrating the process, not the result. And surely, surely there's room to acknowledge that at least we tried, right? So listen to what Jesus says to the church in Thyatira in verse 19. He sees and he knows what they do. In fact, their latter works exceed the first. They are doing more there. Not even just continuing in maintenance mode. All of this despite the challenges that they were facing. And get this, commentators point out that the whole description that you see up there of works, love, faith, service, and patient endurance, it points to the church witnessing witnessing to the city and culture that was around them. Now, when you look at this, you really cannot say that the church didn't try. And yet, and yet, Jesus still holds this one thing against them. And this one thing he holds, it's serious, it's a serious charge that he brings to them. In verse 20, Jesus accuses the church in Thyatira of first tolerating Jezebel, which causes some of them then to follow her in her sinful and idolatrous practice. And later, as verse 22 writes, this ultimately leads to them committing adultery with her. 
Now those guilty of this would face terrible judgment. Verses 22 and 23 promise great trials and even death to those who don't turn away from their ways and repent of the works of Jezebel. Now, if you heard this back then, 2,000 years ago, the mention of the name Jezebel would have immediately brought your mind to the Old Testament. Jezebel was the queen, the wife of King Ahab. And while she was queen, she slowly turned the people of Israel away, away from the worship of God to the worship of idols. Instead of giving God the honour that He deserves, and instead, as living as his people, Jezebel led the people away to lead lives that pursued the lesser things and only chased after their own benefit. To say that the church was tolerating Jezebel and permitting idolatry is shocking. But as we see here, tolerance Tolerance becomes a huge issue when it gets in the way of transformation. Just pause for a moment and imagine this with me. If, you, if it helps you, you can close your eyes. Picture a new Christian convert in the city of Theatira. You can imagine his face, his or her face. It took so much effort persuading constant witnessing to this person before they finally decided to give their life to Jesus, all in spite of the fact that they would face suffering. But because it was such a long journey to bring this person to faith, someone from within the church decides to say that this new convert can continue living as the rest of the city does and participate in the worship of idols. Would you be comfortable with that? I'm guessing that you would be sitting in your pew right now going, hold on, wait a minute. Isn't this a problem? Aren't they idolizing evangelism without a genuine encounter with the life-changing power of the Spirit? Aren't they promoting a witness without acknowledging the weight of sin that they need to turn from? Isn't what they are doing turning away from God rather than turning to Him? Well, yes. But before we point the finger at them, let's hold the mirror up to ourselves. It really doesn't take much for us to see that the church today isn't faring much better. We, we have a long way to go to be fully living as the people of God in a world that needs to see His light. You know, in 2010, the Lausanne Congress, a movement that is focused on mission and world evangelism, they met in Cape Town. And while they were there, they made this very honest assessment of the church. Allow me to read it to us. When there is no distinction in conduct between Christians and non-Christians, for example, in the practice of corruption and greed, or sexual promiscuity, or rate of divorce, or relapse to pre-Christian religious practice, or attitude towards people of other races, or consumerist lifestyles, or social prejudice, then the world is right to wonder if our Christianity makes any difference at all. Our message carries no authenticity to a watching world. Our message carries no authenticity to a watching world. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you can see now it's not just simply doing more. Simply doing more isn't how we are called to live as God's people in a fallen world. If we don't address the issue, this issue at its root, then we would have completely missed the mark. And remember, close enough 
doesn't cut it. There's only one thing that we are called to go all in for, and that is for Christ Himself. You know, we often hear that we become what we behold. And so the question that lies before us this morning is this. What does the Christ we proclaim look like? What does the Christ we proclaim look like? If we seek to make the Christ that we proclaim to the rest of the world fit in with the world, then we are prone to the same idolatry that the church in Theatira fell into. If we are more concerned about making the gospel somehow more palatable, so that people will be more willing to accept it, then the sad truth is that we are servants of the world and not of Christ. Friends, you cannot subtract anything from the good news of Jesus nor add to it without cheapening or distorting it. You cannot add or subtract anything from that gospel because in so doing, we cheapen or distort it. But if the Christ we proclaim, if the Christ we proclaim faithfully is the one described in verse 18 as we see up there, what a difference that would make. If we truly acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and not simply one God amongst many. If we see Him as having eyes like a flame of fire, the same eyes that search our hearts and our minds completely in verse 23. If we truly believe that Jesus is worthy of all and that He sees into the depths of our hearts and our intentions, then our lives will take shape around this truth. It's not a problem of doing that we have. It's a problem of our vision. And repentance is the first step to our lives being shaped and formed around our total commitment to Christ. Verse 22 calls the church at Theatira and us today as well to repent of the works of Jezebel, to lay aside things that obscure our vision of who Jesus really is, the things that lead us away from Him. Dear friends, I'd like to invite us this morning to allow the Spirit to search our hearts today, to show us if there are things that we may need to repent of. So many things can get in the way of us seeing Jesus rightly and serving Him alone. Our pride in our careers, our pursuit of pleasure, our pressing need to feel like we need to fit in. The time for us to repent is now because there will come a day when Jesus will call all things into account. And so I pray that we hear this call from Revelation chapter 2, verse 19 to 23, that we would first and foremost seek to correct our vision, fix our eyes on Jesus, and live in that truth. Because we cannot, we must not get this wrong. To be close enough on this point is to miss the point completely and to deny Christ the glory and honour that He deserves. If we have decided to follow Jesus, then we need to always keep the cross before us and the world behind us. There's really no turning back. We need to be all in for our commitment to Jesus as the Son of God and no other close enough or anything else, anything less than that, just isn't good enough. You know, our first point was a warning of what we should turn away from. But our second point, on the other hand, gives us a promise of what awaits us when we turn to Christ. We go all in 
on our commitment to Jesus because a great reward awaits us when we do. We aren't just left in the lurch without hope, friends. In fact, nothing can be further from the truth. You know, let's return very briefly to my footballing years. You know, the first time my teammate shouted that out, emotions were high, we felt good. But things didn't actually get easier at training. In fact, they got harder. So what kept us going? Well, it wasn't just some far-off promise of victory. In fact, every small win, every time we saw the team playing just a little better, every time we won our friendly matches, we were left encouraged. A glimpse of success, a glimpse of success and the promise that a coming reward is there goes a really long way in motivating people. Not just for football. Think about the time, think about the times that you had to get through long nights of tending to your children when they were infants or perhaps even any other difficult period you had to endure, treatment for a condition, or anything else. Hope for the future drives our faithfulness in the present. To have a vision or a picture of how things turn out, that helps make things make sense in the now. And that's what that's precisely what the letter to the church in Theatira, and maybe even the whole book of Revelation is trying to give. It exposes the evil within us and without, just as we saw earlier. But it also allows for people to see a glimpse of hope. That even though it seems impossible, victory belongs to to God. Verse 25 offers such a powerful promise to the faithful people of God. Christ will come again. Christ will come in glory to deliver His people from the challenges they face for following Him. And the only thing, friends, the only thing that we are called to do is hold fast. Again, it isn't to do more, to shout louder, or to take the world Hit on. It's just to be faithful. Because when we are faithful, Revelations chapter 2, verses 26 to 29, they give us a promise of what awaits us. The one who conquers and keeps Jesus' works and not Jezebel's, that person will be given authority. They will rule with Jesus when he comes again in victory. Now, these verses here. They are almost a direct quotation from Psalm 2, where the psalmist describes the coming Messiah, Jesus, and His kingdom that God will establish. The Messiah is the one, Jesus is the one who was initially promised to rule over the nations with a rod of iron. But this promise that we see in Revelation is amazing. If we are faithful to Jesus, even until death, We get to share in his life. Isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't you want to be found faithful at the end as well? If you do, if you trust in the promises of Jesus, then listen to what he says. Hold fast. Hold fast to Jesus in thought and word and deed. This is where it all comes together. We need to be able to see Jesus rightly and to hold Him in right regard. That becomes possible when we encounter Jesus, the eternal Word, as He has revealed Himself to us. We do so together as a church when we dive into the Word of God. We need to speak of Him rightly, confronting the things that lead us away from Him but also at the same time to bring comfort just as He does. And we need to represent Him rightly, allowing others to encounter Jesus 
through the things that we do. Maybe this is what holding fast might look like as a church. When we aren't just blindly doing more, but instead when we are so captivated by the reality of who Jesus is to us, that our lives are given to Him in response. At this point, maybe I can invite the worship team to come up as we wrap up. We're called to go all in for Christ. To miss the point of who He is would be fatal. But when we do see Him rightly, when we stay faithful to Him and we cling ever so tightly to Him, a great reward awaits us. This isn't a reward that we have somehow earned. Christ won it for us. It's ours to lose. Christ is our all in all and the joy of our salvation now, not just in the distant future. Friends, there's truly nothing in this world that can satisfy, so cling to Him. You know, C.S. Lewis, the famous author of the Chronicles of Narnia, said this, Christianity, if it's false, is of no importance. And if it is true, it is of infinite importance. The only thing that it cannot be is moderately important. This is especially true in times of testing. And it's especially true for us now, today. So friends, would you not go all in and hold nothing back to know Christ our Redeemer and our victorious King? Would you hold nothing back to cling to Him and live as His people? Shall we pray? Lord, help us. Help us to live for You and for You alone. Help us to turn away from the things that have led us away from you. That we may see you rightly and live as your people. Strengthen us by your spirit and allow us to hear you calling out to us. We commit ourselves into your loving hands knowing that you are the one who holds us through the storms, through the trouble. Lord, that you are faithful and that you are coming back for your own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.